I have been looking forward all week to talk about what we're going to talk about today. We want to welcome those of you who are joining online, those of you who are here for the first time. Uh, you know, uh, when I come out and I'm like excited, you know it's something that I've been stewing on for a long time. And I just want to say, we're going to talk about a principle over the next few weeks that is something that you already know. You understand it, you feel it. And what I want you to understand is that if we can grasp the dynamics of this and make this work in our favor, this is a transforming principle for our mental health, uh, for our relationships, for families, work, what have you. So what I need you to do is I'm going to have you pull out your phone right now, okay? I need you to pull out your phone because you're going to take a picture of something. I want you to be able to remember this. I want you to be able to teach this to your kids. I want you to be able to talk about it this week in your small group. And this is a concept that we're going to call the dip, okay? Those of you who are online, you're at full screen. Those of you who are here in the room, you can um, look at the screen that I'm with, or you can look at all. all um. Anyway, just follow along. All right. So anytime that you want to start something new, this is exactly what you're going to go through. Whether you're, let's say you want to lose weight, let's say you want to start a new business, let's say you want to go to law school or whatever, whatever it is, Everything in life goes through this principle, but we usually don't have a name for it, okay? I want you to understand the uh, components of it. On the left-hand side of the chart, you're going to see the y-axis that goes vertically. This is going to represent your emotional state. When you're high up here on the top of the y-axis, you're going to feel optimistic. How many of you have started something and you're like, I'm going to do it, right? We all do that. We all start, we never, none of us start something unless we feel optimistic about it happening. Now, the emotional state can also go down below that. This line right here between optimism and pessimism is something you really want to pay attention to. We all start out with something where we're optimistic, but it quickly can become pessimistic. The x-axis at the bottom refers to time, how long you are into the thing that you are doing. You want to get a degree. You want to be in a relationship that works. You want to make your family better. You want to make more money, whatever it is. You, as time goes on, you're going to notice that there's going to be different phases that you're going through. Your journey is represented by this time. So let's say, for instance, um, you want to get married. You're optimistic. You're right here. You're like, I'm ready. Let's go. You meet the man of your dreams, and then three months after your wedding day, you have gone from optimism <laughs> to pessimism, right? Because he's now leaving underwear all over the floor, right? You, you, he, he, you know, he's getting up in the morning walking naked across the room. You're like, he looks different, okay? Um, you, you, your habits and your communication habits are all coming to the forefront. You're, you're, you're informed and it's pessimistic. You've gone from uninformed optimism to I am now informed and now I'm pessimistic about how this thing's gonna go. And then eventually what happens, let's say you uh, want to go to medical school, all right? You start with uninformed optimism, this is gonna be great. You're down here with informed pessimism because you have taken the MCAT and you've realized how hard it is. And then you go down to phase three, the valley of despair. No matter what you do, you are going to go through the valley of despair. New job, new relationship, new endeavor. You're gonna change a habit. You're gonna kick an addiction. You're gonna do something new. You're gonna go down to the valley of despair. What is the valley of despair? This is the place where you are the lowest, where you have put in enough time and you realize this whole losing weight exercise diet thing is really difficult because I have to do things like actually meal plan and then I have to, I have work and then my kid's ticking me off, you know, and you go through all these different stages, right? And you end up in the valley of despair. The valley of despair in the Bible is always the place of decision. 
You have three options in the valley of despair. The number one thing that people do in the valley of despair is that they run from the valley of despair and they go back up here. I'm going to leave this relationship. I'm going to start over. I am, forget it. I don't want to be a doctor. I'm going to be a nurse or I'm going to do this. You're always going to go back and starting. The second option that people have, and this is a dangerous one, they will stay in the valley of despair. Some of you right now have wanted to do something. You've wanted to be something and you right now are stuck in the valley of despair. It cannot get any darker for you right now. And that's because the longer you stay in the valley, the more you're going to be stuck. You want to change, but you no longer have the will to move. You can go back, you can stay, or you can do what some people are willing to do. You can sit with the pain Accept that pain is a part of life. You can accept the fact that nothing good ever happens in life unless you're willing to pay the price and go through the pain and you can take the next step in the valley of despair. This is January 2nd in the gym, January 3rd, January 4th. I'm not changing. It's May, it's June, it's July. And then all of a sudden you realize you look in the mirror one day and you have informed optimism. You're like, I stuck, with, I stuck with this thing. I am here. And then you push on through to success and fulfillment. This happens a lot when people become Christians, right? You may, like last week, we had a ton of people get baptized. So what an amazing story, all the different journeys that are happening, starting out right here. But what, for those of us who have been disciples of Jesus for a long period of time, what's going to happen to every single one of those people? They're going to go from here at some point, and then they're going to go to here. And they're like, oh, this, this actually is going to require something of me. And then they're going to go down here, and then they're going to say, am I going to stick this thing out, or am I become, going to become a Buddhist? Am I going to stick this thing out and answer the hard questions and work through my conflict and all that kind of stuff, or am I going to start over, or am I going to stay in the valley of despair? Some of you, spiritually, are right higher in the valley of despair. You're not willing to go back. You're not willing to push forward, but you feel very, very comfortable in the darkness. The darkness can be a very, very comfortable place. It's also a place of death. What I want to do today is I want to talk about how this principle shapes our life and the ways we go about pushing through. I love that the band sang this song, Credo, because it reminds us, I believe in Latin, is that as disciples of Jesus, think of every story in the Bible when you're in the belly of the whale, you are in the lion's den, you are in the valley and the armies are attacking and suddenly they realize, I don't have to retreat because down here, I know that I'm not alone. I have the Holy Spirit inside of me that's going to change me. So today what I wanna talk about is I wanna talk about how this works and how this affects um, the way that we choose to live our lives, the way we earn, spend, accumulate finances. 1972, Walter Kavanaugh bet his buddy, I, I bet you a steak dinner that I can get more credit cards than you. And at the end of their little game, Walter Kavanaugh collected 143 different credit cards. At the end of his life, he was in the Guinness Book of World Records. He collected an astounding 1,497 valid credit cards. Now, the reason I bring this up is that when you think of credit cards, I want you to think of consumer debt. When you think of credit cards, you think of consumer debt, you think of car loans, you think of anything other than a house. Consumer debt is something that I'm gonna pay for it now with this installment loan, but it's going to decrease in value. 
The reason we don't lump a house in this is because a house usually is one of the best investments that you can make. So my question to you is, a lot of people, if we can go back to the dip here, we will say, I'm going to live a debt-free life. And then you realize, you're right here, that's it, I'm going to change, I'm going to do this. And then you get down to informed pessimism when your carburetor breaks. And you got to pay for it. And you realize, oh, I don't have like a safety fund. And so I'm going to go down here in the valley of despair. And then I'm just going to say, screw it. I'm going to go ahead and finance whatever I need to because everybody in the world is doing that. So everybody in the world is not doing that. What I would like to do right now and I don't care if you don't want to do it, but you're going to do it because I will come and I'll grab you, okay? You're going to do it anyway. I would like every single person that's here, if you have paid off all of your consumer debt, everything but your house, I want you to stand up. Go ahead, do it right now. Look around. Look around. Look around at these people. Let's give them a round of applause, okay? Well done. Do you know what these people did? Is they got down to the valley of despair when they had a decision and they said, we're willing to sit with the discomfort. We're willing to sit with the pain and we're going to push through that. Now the reason that I wanna go through this is not for you to start back over and say, screw it, or you to wallow in the valley of despair. I want you to push through the dip. My goal is at the end of 2025, you have more money at the end of 2025, you have less debt, less stress, and God is using you as a vessel to, to, expend, to extend his kingdom. That's the goal. That's what happens when you push through the dip. Unfortunately, a lot of people are stuck here. I want to get you out of the valley of despair. Now, a few stats about consumer debt. $1.14 trillion in consumer debt in this country. 600 million active credit cards in the United States. The average household will have $20,000 in credit card debt. One out of every seven Americans has at least 10 credit cards. So that's normal in the United States. That is normal. That's normal where people just keep staying in the pit and they go back, use the card down, go to the pit, go back, use the card again, pit, card. They never push through and actually lose that. Now, Joe Sangal, a friend of ours that we know, said debt is the single greatest cause of stress and financial problems. And so this is, this is not a, a concept of money. This is a concept of relationships and life about we're going to say, that's it, I am, in the, I am in the dip, I'm gonna push through and things are gonna be different one year from now. So the million dollar question is, what length would you be willing to go to to get rid of your debt? I was reading a humorous study where they asked people, what would you be willing to do? And 30% of the people said they would be willing to sell an organ to get out of consumer debt. Now, just lean over right now to the person next to you and tell them what bodily organ would you sell? Do that really fast. A pinky? Like, is it a toe? You know, I can lose a toe, right? I, they, you know, what, do you need your spleen? And like, you know, you definitely don't need your gallbladder, right? So 30%, are we willing to do that, right? 38% said they're willing to take part in a questionable health research study, right? Now, you do this, we'll pay off all your consumer debt, but we can't tell you if this is actually good for you or bad for you, right? You may be the placebo, you may be the person that gets the bad stuff. 38% says that. And then 55% said they would be willing to turn their life into a reality TV show for one year. Would you be willing to do that? Be followed around by a camera. It's online all year long to get rid of your debt. That is actually, that could be a good deal. Now, what if I told you there's a way to push, push through the dip where you don't have to give up a kidney, you don't have to become like a, a, a six Kardashian sister, right? 
would you take that deal? This is, this is the plan. This is what happens. This is how these people that stood up pushed through the dip because it wasn't easy. It involved pain. Proverbs chapter six, verse one says, my son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, that's debt, you borrowed money from your neighbor. If you have shaken hands and pledged for a stranger, you've been trapped by what you said and snared by the words of your mouth. Do this, my son, to free yourself since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands. Go to the point of exhaustion. Let me ask you this. When was the, when was the last time you have been completely and utterly exhausted? I'm not talking about where you need to hit your head and you need to sleep more. I'm talking about physically the exhaustion of that. Give your neighbor no rest. And now allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from a snare of the flower. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Now, a sluggard refers to a lazy person. And let me tell you, I know you. You are not lazy. You're not lazy. In fact, if anything, you're exhausted. You are a hard worker. You care. What this is referring to is there are a hundred different doors in front of us and we have a, ch a limited choice of time, energy, and resources to be able to say, I'm gonna focus on that. The people who push through the dip are people that say, you know what? For this season, we're going to attack that problem and we're gonna stay laser focused. We're not gonna, as it gets harder, we're not gonna turn around and start over and let's do something else. We're gonna make this commitment, we're gonna plan and we're gonna stick through it. We're gonna drive ourselves to the point of exhaustion and pain because we know that the other side of this is freedom. It has no commander, the ant. No overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard, when you know what you need to do? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Let me just say this. I know that there are people here, and I know that there are people watching, who are like, hey listen, I am not like in bad shape financially. We're making money, we're paying the bills, things are good. What I wanna point out is as we go through this, I want you to understand that there are three levels of finances. They're surviving, thriving, and multiplying. Surviving is I'm paycheck to paycheck. I have no savings. I don't know how. I need to get my act together. Thriving is you're making enough money. You're doing fine, but you still don't have your whole financial act together because you're not multiplying. Like, your whole goal is to keep your foot on the gas enough to where you accumulate enough money in the bank so that you can retire, take your foot off the gas, and then coast through the rest of your life, and then roll over as an old man into the grave and be accepted into heaven. That's how most people view their lives financially. I need to get my stuff together. I need to be able to pay my stuff and then I need to be able to go to Boca and sip margaritas by the pool all day. And what the Bible's saying is that there's another level to that, a, a kingdom influence, where you say, not only am I paying everything, I'm thriving, but now I have the ability to create wealth and help other people create wealth, and I'm gonna expand the kingdom. Now, before I get into this text, I wanna say this. Uh, a few years ago, my car was on the over the weekend and I forgot about it. I got up Sunday morning, I get in all my stuff and I'm ready and I go out to the garage and I'm like, crap, where's my car? I'm like, oh, it's in the shop. And then um, I'm like, what am I gonna do? Because there was no one here. I, I wasn't gonna call anybody to pick me up, so I just called an Uber. So here I am, I'm taking an Uber to church. And uh, I like Uber versus renting cars. It's cheaper, the risk, all that kind of stuff. Um, unless, anyway. 
So I'm coming to church, I'm in an Uber. The first thing I always ask the Uber driver is, how long have you been driving Uber? And uh, she said, I've been driving for a couple years. And then I said, why are you driving Uber? What made you want to do that? Because she had already told me she had a job. She said, I'm a single mom, I have three kids, and I've been working so that I can save enough money to take them to Disney World. And I was like, I got to tell you how much I respect you. That you're willing, as Hebrews, as, as it says in the Hebrew, to go to the point of exhaustion. I get up at three o'clock in the morning, and then on the weekends, and then I'm home at 11 when they're up. The oldest can take care of them, and I'm slowly saving money, and I've been doing this for two years because I'm going to take them to Disney World. You know what she could have done? If you can bring up the dip again, here's what she could have done. She could have said, hey kids, we're going to Disney World. Mickey Mouse calls on the phone, you get the ears, you take them down there and put it all on a credit card and go right down here. She said, I'm not going to do that. So do this, my son, to free yourself. It says, go to the point of exhaustion. It literally in Hebrew means to throw yourself down. Not forever, but for a season to focus and say, I'm getting myself out of this stuff. The message translation says, dear friend, if you've, if you've gone into hawk, don't waste a minute. Get yourself out of that mess. Now, humbling yourself involves three things. Number one, like literally humbling yourself, being humble. You know, um, occasionally, we um, on uh, football Saturdays, and I just want to pause and say, You know. You know. What was the score yesterday? High State, Penn State? I, I forgot. Look. I had a picture of Will Howard, our Ohio State quarterback, from Downingtown, because he's a Christian, went to Ohio State. There's the whiteout, and then there's Will leading us to victory. Anyway, you want to humble yourself, right? Occasionally, what we usually do is we'll make a pizza. Um, but usually for Rush or something like that, we, we have a pizza place that we'll go and we'll deliver it. And every time a 40 or a 50 or a 60-year-old man or woman comes to the door delivering the pizza, I always tell them, I appreciate the hustle. I respect that. I can't tell you how many men I've talked to that are down here and they say, what am I going to do deliver pizzas? Yeah. Yeah. Number two, develop a frugal lifestyle. A friend of mine, Carl, is the president of a bank, and he said one Christmas party, one of my employees at one of the branches said, why don't I host the party for upper management? So he goes to this house, and he said, I drive up. He's like, Brian, this house is huge. And he works for me. So I know how much he makes. And then when I go inside, each of the room, each of these rooms, the kitchen, the living room, the dining room, piano, it's decked out. And he said, I'm feeling stupid because here I am, their boss, our house is half their size, and we have literally two rooms that are empty because we don't have the money yet to buy the furniture to fill the two rooms. That's a frugal lifestyle. Larry Burkett said, we spend the first five to seven years of marriage trying to attain the same standard of living as our parents, only it took them, how long? 35 years to do it. But we can't have two rooms that are empty. We're gonna fill the rooms, even if we have to put them on credit. And then the third is to get aggressive. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? So during this series, I'm going to ask you to make some commitments to get through the dip. And the first one is this. Don't say it out loud, but I want you to be able to say this to God. I commit to attack and pay off all my consumer debt. I want you to say, that's it. 
Now, so for those of you who are right now, remember, they're surviving, thriving, and multiplying. For you, that next level of a commitment is now what you're going to do with the money. But for those who are simply at the survival level, who aren't at thriving yet, you're going to say, I'm done with this crap. It's gone. I am no longer going to do that. And so now what I want you to do, if you've made that commitment, I want you to imagine Jesus, your great-great-grandmother, and Dave Ramsey put together a committee, and they're going to help you oversee your finances. What are they going to tell you to do to push through the debt? The first is, stop going into debt. The first thing you got to do is to say, I'm done. I want you to go take your credit cards. I want you to go to your oven, heat it to 350, and put them in there. Now, why aren't we willing to do that? Because we're like, hey, if I get into a bind, rather than trusting God or humbling myself real fast, it's a whole lot easier to pull the card out. I'm gonna stay here. I've, I'm choosing right now. If I keep these cards, I'm choosing to stay right here at the dip. Number two, save $1,000 real fast. Remember, you have to translate this. If you're surviving, you need to save $1,000 fast because when you have a problem with your car, this is where you're gonna take the money. But there are some of you who think you're thriving because you're paying your bills. You're putting some money in retirement, but you have no emergency fund, zero. You're over here in the multiplying phase. You've gone through thriving. You've gone, to, you've gone through um, all of these stages, but yet you're ready to go to Boca. That's all your, how can I retire early? How can I get that car? How can I get that second or that third home? And God's like, come on, man. You're not dead yet. I want to do so. I want to give you some dreams. Number three, the third step, what they would tell you to do is to tithe. Do not stop giving to the Lord. That's one of the first things you do. When you're down here in the dip and you're like, hey, I want to push through, well, it'd be super easy. If I just stop giving to the church, then I have that money available. And God wants me to do this. That's not what God is saying, is that you down here are going to display faith and tenacity. I'm going to believe God is going to come through for me, and I'm going to push through with tenacity. Ecclesiastes 11.4 says, farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. And so for disciples of Jesus that say, I'm going to wait till I'm over here financially, then I'm going to start to give. Usually these people never leave the pit. Number four, and I want to encourage you to do that. This week, I want to rank your debts from smallest to largest. And I want you to give that sheet. Let me just pause here and say, and for those of you who are in a relationship, usually... There's a saver and there's a spender. Which one are you? Usually, the person that does the finances is the person that's most detail-oriented, okay? The biggest problem that families have with finances is that one person knows where we are and then the other person doesn't. You need to put your financial situation very clearly at a point where you can see the entire picture, every single week you hand a piece of paper and say, this is where we are. You have to have an agreement about how you're going to spend your money. Lisa and I have a commitment. We're not going to spend more than $200 on anything unless both of us agree. And if we disagree, I decide because I'm the man. <laughs> it, I'm just kidding. Right? You agree. Like, there has to be a spending limit. The other thing is I will say you this. What is your baseline dollar amount? My baseline dollar amount is $10. Anything $10 and above. Not that $5 doesn't matter to me, but $10, I fight for $10. That matters. 
For you, that may be a hundred, that may be a thousand, depending on your financial situation. But if I can save $10, I'm saving $10. So rank your debts from the smallest and you use the debt snowball. If you're paying $2,000 a month on all your debt, you attack the first one first, you pay it off, but you keep paying the $2,000 and you keep adding to that and paying that off. Soon you're going to realize, man, this is, this is, this is, we're going to nail this fast. Number five, create a budget. Now, some of you that are in the thriving category, you're saying, yeah, people that are just surviving, they need to create a budget. Bull crap. Some of you are sitting on a lot of money. And what does Jesus say? To whom thou is given much, much is going to be required. And you need to be paying attention Dollar in, dollar out. Where's this money going? Um, every fall is the year where I go and I try to find $500,000 that I can, no, 500000 $500 that I can cut from our budget. Usually I can, I'm able to find $350. First call is uh, I go sell bill, then I go to um, you know, the cable, and then car insurance has gone crazy but there are some great insurance companies out there where you can cut your thing at least 40% right now. I mean, across the board, and it's a game for me. How can I save this money? Why do I do this? Because what's the story? Jesus gave this guy some money, this guy some money, and this guy some money, and the person that took it and multiplied it. You take that money that you don't have in debt, now you're going to be putting this into businesses and other wealth-creating modalities that are going to work for you even when you're asleep. That's what Jesus is talking about with money. John Maxwell says, a budget is telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. There is some tremendous software out there that can help you with this. Number six, live on beans and rice. Do you like beans and rice? Yeah. I actually love beans and rice. I just, I could have that for a meal every week. I love beans and rice. So maybe it's, I don't know, live on bugs and something like that. But what is it that you can cut? How much money do you spend on eating out? How much money, heaven forbid, do you spend on coffee? Do you know? Remember, $10 for me is a lot. How much do you spend on cigarettes? Number seven, go get a part-time job. For a season, go get a part-time job. Remember, go to the point of exhaustion. Go get a part-time job. Number eight, pray for creativity and wisdom. And I do think that this is what Dave Ramsey, Jesus, and Grandma would say. So right now, what I want you to do in your mind, between you and Jesus right now, I want you to make this commitment. Jesus, to you, I commit to attack and pay off my consumer debt. I believe you're with me down here in the valley of despair. And I'm gonna stay here, I'm not going back, I'm gonna push through because I believe you're with me. And then I want you to commit to be here for the next three weeks. You do believe that your life is not over, right? You do, you do understand that, you know, for those of you who are young and you're single, you'll realize very quickly that the definition of life essentially for people is to get through their education, get their job, to get married, to have kids, to get the house, and then the cement hardens around their feet, because they've done everything that they know they need to do. You do understand, I don't care if you're the oldest person in this room. Isaiah, I am going to do a new thing in your life. Do you not see it? I want to give a dream to you for your life. Some of you, the reason you need to get out of the dip is because God's calling you to start a new business. Maybe God is calling you to be a missionary. Maybe God is calling you to do something that you want to do, but the reason you won't is because you have grown to settle and love the darkness because it's safe there. No one can get you. 
Well, the Holy Spirit can. And so, Heavenly Father, I pray, I pray that you would give new dreams. I pray that you would help all of us to see the potential. A year or two or three of some hard work and freedom. Breathe new life into our hearts. We have been so worn down by life that we have, ex- stop, we have stopped expecting. We have stopped believing. We have stopped reaching and planning and goal setting. And we're now just settled in the darkness. When are the eagles on? What's the next show on Netflix? What else can I eat? What else can I do? Heavenly Father, may your Holy Spirit breathe life in the dry bones. May you bring miracles through your power, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.